today to announce the largest acquisition program in the history of the Department of Defense. Roger copy. The Joint Strike Fighter. Joint Strike Fighter. Joint Strike Fighter. And just for the record, pilot, yeah, you are my hero. <laughs> in the skies over the Mojave Desert, a battle of X-planes has begun. That looks good. Over the next year, Two different planes will take to the skies again and again on a relentless quest to be crowned the fighter of the future. Perhaps the last manned fighter the U.S. will ever build. Oh, it smooths out beautifully. <laughs> this is fun. Great, it was great. super, yeah. Thank God, you very it much. So oh, awesome. oh, it felt great. We're going to fly the out of this airplane and just kick every day. That's what it's all about. It's all part of a top secret competition, locking two of America's aerospace giants in a furious engineering dogfight to the death. You couldn't have a more interesting competition. Two very different companies and two very different designs. Conservative heavyweight against the radical newcomer. We got a hell of a smart team, so let's go figure out how to make it work. Whoa. There's never really any time to relax. Would I like to be further ahead? Yes. Would I like to be farther done? Yes. I think we truly believe that we've got the right vehicle for the customer. It's starting to look like an airplane. That's what's really neat about oh, it. Oh, I see a future contract. Yeah, well, that too. Not just any contract, but the most lucrative contract in military history. At least $200 billion. steering is off. And the winner won't be just any fighter. It will need to land on a carrier evade enemy radar, hover like a helicopter. But trying to build a fighter that can do all three, it's a tremendous challenge. It's not a natural thing for a uh, jet airplane to do. Come on, Simon. Experimental new designs come with their share of risks and failures. The 402 left to the downwind. But now, the US military desperately wants a winner claiming that aging fighters and shrinking budgets threaten to undermine its command of the skies. Going to 76. Will a one-size-fits-all fighter, a joint strike fighter, work for the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines? Will it rescue them from the death spiral of defense costs? With unprecedented access from the Department of Defense, Nova's cameras take you into the U.S. military's most classified facilities, from the beginning to repeated trial and error. Can I reset? Negative. We're recommending we abort. The original design wasn't going to hack it. How much effort is ahead of us to make it work? Watch two teams struggle to get their daring ideas off the drawing board and into the air. The Joint Strike Fighter will be the world's premier strike platform. With a decision to proceed now made, it is now appropriate to announce the winner of the Joint Strike Fighter competition. In the end, only one winner takes all. Yeah! In the Battle of the X-Planes. Up next on Nova. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. Science. It's given us the framework to help make wireless communications clear. Sprint is proud to support NOVA. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.
ever be another program as complex as this or as big as this when you start talking about dollars. It's called the Joint Strike Fighter Program. For five years, the JSF has held a competition between two titans of aerospace to see who will build the next generation fighter. It's a prize worth up to $200 billion. And the winner's name is in the bag. The winner of the JSF competition is going to dominate the fighter aircraft market, not only here in the United States, but worldwide. Fasten your seatbelt and put up your tray table. Nova and the Department of Defense have cleared you to enter places where cameras have never gone before. From secret installations to the cockpits of the latest experimental fighters, you've landed in the classified world of the X-Planes, both high-tech and handcrafted, where pilots fly into the unknown with just you by their side. This is the battle to build the fighter of the 21st century. In the first strike in the war on terror, fighters are the frontline warriors. Navy fighters join squadrons from the Air Force and the Marines to attack Taliban and Al-Qaeda positions in Afghanistan. These aircraft play a key role in routing the enemy. Just as they did in the Gulf War in the early 1990s. In fact, some of the fighters are literally the same planes. Built in the 80s, designed in the 70s, to fulfill Cold War objectives from the 60s. The most important weapon in America's arsenal is based on ideas almost a half century old. Our uh, airplanes, they're wearing out. They're tired. A 30 year airplane, still a great airplane, service purpose as well, but it's, it's old. These aircraft in the future battlefield, they're going to be a bit like dinosaurs. Not just in their sort of physical age, but their electronic capability. They may not be survivable. We now have to go to higher altitude instead of lower altitude. We need to make ourselves as small as possible from a radar perspective. We have to do the same job, but the world has changed. Almost all of America's fighters will one day wind up here, at the boneyard of Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona. Old generals may fade away, but old fighters are cannibalized for parts. The Air Force still relies on thousands of these, the venerable F-16. But the F-16 is past its prime. In the age of stealth, this fighter shows up on radar the size of a small flying house. This is an F-18, the mainstay of the Navy. But Navy planes get old fast. The controlled crash, known as a carrier landing, and the rapid acceleration of a catapult launch will eventually create irreparable stress fractures and send them all here. This is the subsonic AV-8 Harrier jump jet, flown by the Marines. While it remains the only successful vertical landing fighter, it dates back to the British invasion of America by the Beatles. Though later refined by McDonnell Douglas, by any measure, the Harrier is ready for retirement. The goal of the Joint Strike Fighter program is to replace all of these, the F-16, the F-18, and even the vertically landing Harrier. 
it is absolute vital necessity to have an, not only a replacement airplane for the older airplanes, but to have an airplane that's a 21st century airplane to meet the needs for tomorrow. The plane for the 21st century, at least for the Air Force, would appear to be already here. The new F-22 Raptor, scheduled for deployment in 2005. The Raptor is the ultimate fighter. So stealthy, its radar signature isn't much bigger than a bird. And it can fly at supersonic speeds longer than any other fighter. And that means it can strike deeply and invisibly at an opponent. But the Raptor has a huge vulnerability that the JSF program must overcome, a giant price tag. Each plane costs about $100 million. The F-22 is a spectacular airplane. The problem is it's expensive. And that means the Air Force will never really have enough of them to attack the many and varied small and large targets that make up the modern battlefield. The F-22 is just the latest example of a trend that goes back decades. Each new generation of fighters costs more than the last, so fewer are purchased. Ever more expensive fighters in ever decreasing numbers. In defense circles, that's known as the death spiral. Where the death spiral could lead is the prediction that in the year 2054, the U.S. defense budget will only buy one airplane. So the Air Force uses the airplane in the morning, the Navy uses it uh, in the evening, and uh, the Marines, unfortunately, only get to use it every leap year on the extra day. So that is the JSF's Mission Impossible, to break the death spiral by coming up with a new fighter that costs a third of an F-22, replaces all of these, and meets the needs of the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines. They absolutely said, you'll never pull this off. Impossible. In the past, the fiercely independent services would have fought for their own weapons programs. In the 60s, when the cost-cutting Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, forced the Navy and Air Force to use the same plane, the F-111, the joint program was a resounding flop. But these days, with smaller post-Cold War budgets, the spreadsheet is mightier than the sword. The Joint Strike Fighter program was a huge leap of faith for the services. The enabler, though, was they didn't have any choice. They knew that they had to modernize their fighter force structure, and the funds were not available to do that. With no other options, the effort to design the Joint Strike Fighter begins. And almost immediately, there's a disagreement. The services can't even agree on the number of engines. The Navy's F-18 Hornet has two engines for safety. If one goes out, you don't have to ditch. But two engines are a deal killer for the Marines because of their weight. You cannot build today a two-engine vertical short takeoff landing airplane. Uh, so the Navy wanted two engines. Marine Corps had to have a single engine. And the Air Force wanted a single engine because it was much more affordable and they don't have it. They're not out over the ocean at night all by themselves like we are. The decision hinges on how dependable one engine can be. Steady state 255 started. After talking with jet manufacturers, the JSF team ramps up the specs for engine reliability. Rear Admiral Steidel convinces a reluctant Navy to go with just one. That was another piece that uh, was necessary to pull the program together. Because without that, we could not have a common production line. I think the effort that's gone on here to create a joint requirement is, is astounding. And it's really, the, it's what's allowed the program to get where it is. And it will be what allows the program to continue because if the services keep saying, we all agree what we want and we want this aircraft, then it will happen. Even with everyone on board, there's rough air ahead. We know how to build a stealth fighter. We know how to build a long-range, agile fighter. We may even have a good way of building a fighter that can land and take off vertically. 
but trying to build a fighter that can do all three is very, very difficult. The Pentagon spent over $3 billion in research to see if it was possible. And the answer, sort of. The airplanes are not the same aircraft, but the building blocks are the same building blocks for the most part. Same engine, same major avionics. In fact, it's not important to have every piece part the same, but the expensive parts or modules. Through the life cycle of the aircraft, there was the potential to save $60 billion. And that's a lot of money in anybody's calculus, even in the Department of Defense. With the services in agreement about the requirements, the Joint Strike Fighter program launches a competition for innovative designs for the new affordable family of fighters. Like a high stakes game show, only two contractors can make it to the final round and build test planes. With billions on the line, U.S. defense contractors hold their breath as the Pentagon announces the two finalists for who wants to build the next generation fighter. These contractors are Lockheed Martin and Boeing. The announcement sends shockwaves through the aerospace industry dealing a death blow to one of the most respected names in aviation, McDonnell Douglas, a company with a fighter legacy that seemed to guarantee a spot in the final round, doesn't make the cut. The impact for the company and its employees is devastating. Within two years, McDonnell Douglas is sold to Boeing, one of the JSF winners. A world leader in commercial jets, the Seattle-based company is seen as an unlikely contender in a fighter battle, for good reason. Boeing's last fighter was built in the 1930s, the P-26 Pea Shooter, a fighter from the age before jets, before even a closed cockpit. Boeing hadn't built a fighter in a long time. I, and I think early on, uh, Boeing was considered literally a dark horse in this competition. But the Boeing acquisition of McDonnell Douglas, the builder of the Navy's F-18, and the Marines' Harrier makes a dark horse an even bet. By acquiring McDonnell Douglas, Boeing suddenly moves from becoming the least experienced JSF team to possibly the most experienced. Clearly leveled the playing field. I'm in this job to win, and uh, going back to... F Boeing's JSF effort is led by Frank Statkiss, an engineer and 30-year company man. When you shoulder the weight of a potential $200 billion contract, stress comes with the job. A year ago, I had hair, and it was dark. And now I have less of it, and it's a race to see what goes gray versus goes away. What's our G2 and the other guy? While Statkiss runs the project, he isn't the creator of Boeing's design. These days, with the complexity of fighters, no single person can claim that role. State-of-the-art fighters. They're all designed now by computers. And it's, and it's, these are big teams of engineers who sit down, you know, and, and do these CAD-CAM drawings. It's very tough to find, uh, you know, one person who can sit there and tell you that I designed that airplane. At the heart of the Boeing design for the JSF is a large delta, or triangular, wing. It's an unusual approach, but the big advantages of that are that it's structurally simple and that it contains an enormous amount of fuel. Though there hasn't been an American fighter built with a delta wing since the 60s, the design has its advantages. The fastest jet ever to fly the SR-71 Blackbird has a delta wing because it decreases drag at supersonic speeds. 